Hello everyone, thank you for joining us tonight at the National Museum of Computing for this uh, virtual talk. Um, it's uh, great to have you all here with us in person and virtually, or mostly virtually. Um, I'm of course Gavin Clark and tonight we are going to be discussing some big uh, universe size computing, stuff we're all happy to embrace I hope. Um, as you know the topic of this is uh, compute the universe inside CERN's big data expanse. This is very much a, a discussion about pushing the bounds of uh, how big science pushes the bounds of com uh, computing and it has in the past and it has right now. And there's no better example of that, of that than the Large Hadron Collider, which is, which is over at CERN, uh, where they're attempting to unlock the, the mysteries of the universe, some of which uh, we know very much very well, um, and others such as the uh, time traveling with neutrinos which got people very excited a few years back so they're really getting in there tackling some some um, theories of the universe which have, and, and finding out new discoveries um, and with us of course is Tim Bell and Tim I've known for a few years now Tim's response is respons responsible for the group at CERN who are supplied the IT infrastructure for the laboratory. They manage the compute infrastructure that's used by 13,000 physicists around the world to support this kind of fundamental level of research. Uh, they've been running um, a, a cloud system since 2013. Um, I think at the last count, I'm always trying to catch up with the numbers, but we seem to be updating 320,000 cores of compute, mm -hmm. I think, but I'm sure that's incorrect. At the moment, Tim, Tim will put me straight on that. And at the last count, uh, producing 30 petabytes of data a year. Does that sound correct, Tim? I'm not, not quite sure, but again- It's, it's a bit higher now, yes, under normal circumstances. Yeah. Of course, of course. Um, Tim, Tim's gonna be look, giving you, uh, it's always an honor to hear about uh, Large Hadron Colliders because of its sheer scale. Um, and obviously we can't travel, we, most of us can't get there under normal circumstances, never mind where we are right now and into the future, but you can do trips to, to visit it, I'm told. I know I should be going there in the future at some point. Um, we can look inside the compute of CERN, inside these big physics experiments, uh, inside the experiments themselves, inside the compute that goes on there. And we'll be looking at um, what, it, what technology it takes to keep this thing to running. And hopefully we'll be taking a look at how it is challenging, not just compute now, but in the future and some of the high performance computing that's coming down the line and how CERN has, has teamed up with some other large science organizations to tackle some of these compute challenges which are coming uh, in, in the not too distant future for these guys. So um, as ever, please, I'm gonna ask if everyone could please just mute, mute your uh, audio for now. Uh, we will take questions at the end, obviously, please, if you, something comes to mind, make a note, we will definitely come to you at the end. Um, and I think that's about it. Tim, over to you. Great, thanks a lot. Um, so my name is Tim Bell, and uh, as Gavin mentioned, I look after the computer monitoring team as part of the IT department at CERN. So our job is basically to deliver the compute infrastructure for the lab. So for those of you who, who aren't aware of CERN, so CERN's the world's largest laboratory for particle physics. Uh, it's basically trying to understand the fundamental nature of the universe, how it works, what it's made of. And we're located straddled across the Swiss French border um, just outside Geneva. Um, you can see Geneva Airport there for scale, and uh, I'll come on a little bit more later to the number of rings that are there and, uh, and explain those a bit further. So when we look back and work out what is the nature of uh, matter um, from your uh, physics and uh, chemistry lessons, you might remember the, the basic breakdown of matter, the stuff we can feel, and as we drill down further, then we get to atoms orbiting with electrons and nucleuses. Um, they're made up of protons and neutrons. The protons themselves also have some structure to them. Um, and these are quarks. And as far as we know so far, these quarks are the most fundamental unit of building block. However, if we look back in time, uh, the Greeks felt the atoms could be the, uh, the fundamental building block. So one of the things that we draw down on is, is the quark really the smallest item that we can identify? So one of the puzzles that we're looking at with the accelerators is to try and recreate the conditions just after the Big Bang. Um, so at this point, a huge burst of energy created 
what is basically the fundamental uh, matter and building blocks that have produced our universe. And over the past 14 billion years, the universe has been gradually expanding. So on the one hand, we're there creating the conditions after the Big Bang. On the other hand, the telescopes and astronomers are out there looking at the universe as it expands and actually have effectively a time machine. If they look further away, then they can see a younger part of the universe. And this means that these combinations of sciences together allow us to start building up some of the complex questions about what is the nature of our universe. CERN's laboratory was founded in 1954, um, just after the Second World War as a place where scientists and the member states could come together in peace. And it's always been a very fundamental nature of the organization that uh, regardless of the political uh, combinations of people, the goal is to identify and work on science. We start off with 12 member states. The UK was a founding uh, member state and we now have passed to 23 in total. Um, and there's also a fairly large number of different kinds of associated member states. Some are gradually coming online um, and will eventually move towards member states. Others are in observer status, which allows them to come along to the meetings, take part in some of the discussions, but they don't get to vote on some of the CERN council matters. The budget itself, it's about 1.2 billion Swiss francs. Um, so this is roughly equivalent to a, a medium-sized university. Um, and that also corresponds to roughly a cup of coffee uh, for each person from the member states. So this means that for the price of a cup of coffee, you get to understand how the universe works, which seems a, a reasonable deal. Um, the employees of CERN itself, there's actually only about 3,000, 3,500 staff and fellows who are actually directly employed by CERN. The primary focus of CERN here is to provide the facilities for the 12,000 visitors, visiting scientists to come and use the facilities both on site and also remotely. Um, and that way they can benefit from the infrastructure that the laboratory provides to do their experiments. We have a, a history of significant breakthroughs in, uh, in physics. Um, so back from the original invention of particle detectors when George Sharpak uh, had charged wire uh, detectors to pick up cloud experiments and identify the particles through Carlo Rubia and Van der Meer, who uh, identified the W and Z bosons as part of the large electron positron experiment, the LEP experiment in the 90s. And then a very emotional event in, in 2012, where uh, Professor Higgs and Professor Englert came to CERN. And at that point, the experimental results were presented to them, where two independent experiments were able to identify the Higgs boson and with that confirm a theory that had been invented 50 years earlier. And for that, they collected the Nobel Prize in 2013. The Higgs boson itself is what gives us mass. Um, without it, we will be zooming around the universe at the speed of light. So it's a useful particle. So how do we go about making these discoveries? Um, to do it, we build what is basically the largest piece of scientific equipment on the planet. Um, and with that, we actually study the smallest particles in the universe. It's a strange uh, challenge between something so massive to study something so small. Technology is driven a lot in order to do this. Um, these aren't things you can just go to the local uh, store and, and buy. Um, there is only one LHC and a lot of the components have been custom developed for the purposes that we're using them. The accelerator itself uh, gradually fires up through a series of accelerator complexes to get the particles going up close to the speed of light. The detectors are where we then envisage, visualize the data and then with that are able to understand the collisions that go on. And then the computing area is becoming increasingly important in order to be able to allow us to understand and process all of the data that comes from the accelerator. So it's really these three working in combination, um, physics, engineering, and computing. So the, the flagship experiment, so the flagship accelerator is the Large Hadron Collider. Um, it's 27 kilometers in circumference. Um, so to give you a feeling, it takes like 20 minutes on a, on a good day to drive from one side to the other side. It's 100 meters underground. 
Um, this allows us to protect the accelerator from cosmic rays, which are beams of particles coming from the sun, and also avoided that we needed to purchase a large amount of land on the surface. The, the accelerator itself, um, there are two very small one centimeter tubes inside, which are hollowed out to a vacuum that's less than that on the moon, to a pressure that's less than that on the moon. And it is surrounded by superconducting magnets. These are magnets cooled down to minus 271 degrees centigrade with liquid helium. And with this, then they form properties where you're able to put a very, very high current through them, which is what's needed to steer these very high speed uh, particle beams around the ring, keeping them inside the tube and lined up so they don't then have any collisions with the walls of the, the tubes. The particles themselves are just below the speed of light by the time they get to full acceleration. Um, and those are then fired around and then collided. So we have four points around the ring where these collisions occur. As you can see, there's the smaller accelerator complexes, which are actually the ones from previous generations of experiments that are used to actually accelerate the particles up to speed. So they start off from a small hydrogen bottle. We strip the electrons off, so we get protons, and then we fire the protons in two different directions around the ring in those two separate tubes. And in four places, we, we cross the beams. Um, and with that, we then arrange to have the particle collisions occurring where those detectors are. The detectors themselves are varied. Um, so ATLAS and CMS are general purpose detectors. These are two different sides of the ring and they allow us to look for general physics properties. Um, they have a wide range of potential uh, areas to understand and look at. And these two were the ones that independently identified the Higgs boson. By having completely separate teams, completely separate experiments, then we eliminate the chances of there being an error due to uh, software bugs, due to hardware and bad signals, um, such as the one that Gavin mentioned um, when we had the neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light, we were eventually able to tr track that one down to a, to a bad signal. There are also two specialized detectors. Um, the ALICE detector, this looks um, at particle collisions throughout the year, but during one month, we arrange to circulate lead ions. These are 200 neutrons and protons that we send round and then collide. And this creates the conditions just after the Big Bang quark gluon plasma that allows us to then really study the properties of these ion collisions. And then LHCb that's looking for an intriguing uh, set of uh, features where there seems to be some asymmetry in the universe. And in particular, by being very precise and measuring specific measurements related to this asymmetry, then they are looking to try and understand some of those questions that we are asking ourselves. So in terms of collisions, um, with these two beams, we produce around 1 billion particle collisions a second when the accelerator is running. At the moment, we're just coming to the end of our second shutdown. Um, these are periods during which we get in, get open up the detectors, warm up the pipes, do maintenance work, do upgrades. Um, and now that's coming to an end with the aim that the accelerator will then be starting up relatively soon with the collisions starting at the beginning of next year. Sending around these beams at just under the speed of light means that when they collide, you get the E equals mc squared conversion, energy into mass. They create new particles. Some of these particles are very short-lived and decay into other ones. Other ones uh, continue out, and those are then detected by the detectors. The detectors themselves can be viewed as like uh, 3D cameras. Um, so with this, they have magnetic fields inside so that charged particles are bent and we can follow that track. And equally, they have different layers of material so that the higher energy particles will go further out without being stopped by the different layers of the detector. They take around 40 million pictures a second. Um, so this can be viewed like a 100 megapixel camera. Um, and then only around a thousand of those are actually recorded in the end. Uh, we have masses of electronics that analyze that data as they are collided and select the ones that are most interesting potentially for new physics. The texts themselves are independently built 
Um, so they are collaborations around each of the experiments of around 3,000 or so people for the larger ones like Atlas and CMS. So these are very geographically distributed, different components uh, built and tested in the laboratories around the world. And then they're assembled at CERN into these uh, detectors that are the size of Westminster Cathedral. They weigh about 7,000 tons, um, like an air aircraft carrier. And these are positioned to micrometer precision around the beams. So clearly the, the engineering work is significant there also. But it's not just the, the Large Hadron Collider, there's actually a very diverse scientific program. Um, we have a theory division that's looking at two scenarios. One is trying to understand how the theory could map into the experiment uh, situations. This means that they could predict, for example, that in the event of a certain kind of collision, then we would expect to see something uh, with a particular characteristic. But they also do the same work, which is that when the experimentalists identify something which is unusual, then the theorists, theorists get together and try and devise a theory that could explain this behavior. So in the first case, uh, Professor Higgs and Englert sat down and came up with this idea of, uh, of a particle to prove mass. And then we were able to then demonstrate it uh, 50 and 60 years later. But we also do other physics. The nuclear physics is where we take um, isotopes, so um, atoms of different kinds, uh, and then we fire particle beams at them in order to study their properties. And that's the Isolde uh, facility. I have just down the office, down the road from me, uh, an antimatter factory. Um, and this is used to allow us to study the properties of antimatter. Um, one of the natures of matter, so of the collisions is that we create antimatter and matter as part of this uh, energy goes into mass process. And there we actually slow down antiprotons in order to be able to then study their properties. And we've recently been able to also circulate an anti-electron, a positron around them in order to create anti-hydrogen. And then we can study things like, um, do they fall or rise in gravity? They, they fall, by the way. Um, we look at um, some cosmic ray studies, and in particular, in the aspect of climate studies, what is the effect of these rays of particles coming from the sun in terms of their impact on cloud formation? Fixed target experiments where we have a fixed target where we fire beams into them in order to study for really rare phenomenon. And then we also work with the Fermilab uh, facility outside of Chicago as part of the study into these really unusual particles called neutrinos that have a lot of very interesting properties. Um, including the ability to pass through large amounts of matter without getting affected. That having been said, we still have a lot of unanswered questions. So the Higgs has been a, a, a major advance in terms of understanding, but we do have a situation where when we look out into the universe, um, we can see the planets and stars moving around, and therefore we can estimate the amount of mass and energy there should be. Um, we then go through the observation process to try and identify what that corresponds to. And we find we've actually lost about 95% of the universe. Um, so 5% are things that we can identify, but there's something out there, dark matter, matter dark energy, um, that we haven't been able to identify yet. There's the question of the asymmetry that LHCB in particular is looking at. Um, after the Big Bang, we ought to have had equal amounts of matter and antimatter. Um, it's good that we don't, since when the two meet, they uh, annihilate. But there has to be some reason why matter came out of that massive explosion as being the, the dominant form without that much antimatter around. So we're looking for the asymmetry that leads uh, matter to be the preferred combination. We want to study the Higgs boson. Um, it clearly contributes towards uh, mass and what is the, the nature of uh, mass. But is there only one and what's the exact properties? And then finally, it's the question of why is gravity so weak? Gravity is a really unusual force compared to some of the under fundamental forces. Um, and it operates over quite a large distance. And it's therefore not trivial to map that into some of the standard theories, um, like the standard model, which is what we use to model the rest of the, uh, the, part, the quarks and forces combinations. Going forward, um, we always are having to plan a long way ahead. Um, so 
any program that's going on at the moment, we're also planning and doing the engineering work in order to be able to understand what the next step of the LHC is. Many of these uh, components require decades in order to develop the science, push back the frontiers, such that we're able to then bring online new equipment. The high luminosity LHC, which is due to start in 2027, will allow us to have 10 times more collisions than the LHC. And we'll do that by sending around bunches. We already send around some bunches, but we'll be sending around massive bunches of particles. And then as they pass each other, the chances of a collision are a lot higher, and therefore we get a lot more statistics, but also a lot more data. That means we'll be able to discover with a lot more precision certain rare phenomena and also be able to really pin down some of the parameters of some of the fundamental particles. This we expect to run till around 2040 in terms of the program for the, the LHC. After the LHC, we're already studying now. Um, this is the post 2040 timescale. And clearly we have the goals as part of the European strategy to fully exploit the uh, high luminosity LHC. But then we're starting to study how we could build a Higgs factory. This would be a, a tuned machine in order for us to mass produce Higgs uh, particles and really drill down on the properties of the Higgs boson. To do this, we're assessing the technical and financial feasibility in order to build a larger accelerator. Clearly, we would use the Large Hadron Collider as part of the accelerator chain, much as we've used the earlier accelerators like the proton synchrotron and the super proton synchrotron to accelerate up particles. And this would be around 100 kilometers. Um, it would go under the Geneva Lake. Uh, and clearly, we would do a lot of study of the geology and practicalities of, of that. And it will be basically between the Jura mountains and the pre-Alps on the other side. At the same time, we're also working with laboratories around the world. So uh, laboratories such as the ones in Japan, looking at linear accelerators and the Fermilab uh, neutrino facility. So the offshoot of pushing the frontiers of, of science is that at the same time we produce spin-offs. Um, accelerator technology is used today in order to do cancer therapy. Um, so these fine beams of particles are actually much easier to focus, which means you can target um, tumors very precisely using protons and ion beams. And these are used in advanced facilities in order to treat some of the more difficult cancer treatments. The magnet facilities are used in uh, the various medical scanning and imaging devices. So the same technologies that we have used in the past to improve the CERN magnets are then being taken by industry and used as part of this medical imaging. We also use the imaging technology that we use from the detectors in order to work through some medical high resolution imaging. And this allows us to then be looking at very fine grain details and 3D modeling, which is the kind of technology that we have to have available as part of our modeling of collisions. And as part of some of our uh, work, we're actually able to then produce radioisotopes by colliding particle beams with other atoms and then being able to produce specialized radioisotopes for certain treatments. CERN as a, as a site is actually, I think it's the Geneva TripAdvisor top site to visit. Um, and we have a mass of student uh, visitors under normal circumstances. So it's a, around 150,000 people each year have come along to have a chance to look around the site. Um, the visits are gradually coming back. Um, you can now go on site and arrange to have a visit for that day. Um, and we hope to be able to start resuming school programs uh, in the future. Um, it's always a, a great thing to have an opportunity to bring a teacher along with their school class and show them around. You can really understand the enthusiasms that come from seeing the applications of science uh, in real life. So from the UK, we had around um, 12,000 visitors in 2019. Uh, to give you a feeling, many of the people are coming significant distances in order to come and visit. And there are sometimes during the shutdowns, we had one in 2019, where we actually completely open up the site and then people can come on and they're then able to also go underground and have a look around at the detectors. You wouldn't want to do that when the accelerator is running. It's an area that's very high security and uh, uh, no people are allowed down during the actual accelerator running. So in 2017, we also had the, uh, the pleasure to host uh, Boris Johnson who came over while he was uh, foreign secretary. 
and we got a chance to show them around all the facilities. Going forward, um, we're in the process now as part of a charitable foundation to build a new experimental, uh, sorry, new display and conference facility. This will be the CERN Science Gateway. Um, it'll straddle the road from France through to Switzerland and will allow us to then be able to do more outreach, uh, larger numbers of immersive exhibitions using even more advanced technology like virtual reality. Um, this will be open to the general or public for anyone aged five or over from 2023 onwards. So the computing side. Um, so CERN computing has had a long history. Um, we didn't go quite as far back as some of the earlier machines in the EDSACs in the 40s, but um, we had in the 50s a, a computer. Um, it, it was actually a person called Vim Klein. And his job was to be given all the difficult maths problems for the laboratory, and he would then work them out. But after a while, that wasn't a scalable solution. So the first systems were for anti-mercury. This had a magnetic drum that was rather unreliable. Um, it took a few years to commission, but uh, was allowing us towards the end of the 50s to be able to start writing code in a language called autocode. And this was then used to analyze the results of cloud chamber collisions. In the 60s, things started to, uh, to warm up a little bit. Uh, we got some control data systems. Um, the, the terminals are, are incredible when you think back to the uh, cathode ray tubes um, and uh, compare them to today's uh, LEDs. And there was a lot of paper tape. Um, we then also brought in some IBM mainframes. And with that came along Fortran for the first time at CERN. This will continue to be used as the primary language for scientific computing for the next four decades. The 70s, we store, saw the new accelerators coming online, the proton synchrotron, the super proton synchrotron. And to control those, at CERN, we invented the first capacitive touch screen. Um, this is now the standard technologies that's used in the mobile phones. Um, to, in order, but we used it at the 70s in order to allow us to control the accelerator. And it was also the point when the groundbreaking uh, work was done in order to build the first CERN data center. Um, this is actually still the one in use today. It also had this new feature of online connections to the experiments. So the experiments were able to send data directly to the computer center for analysis. The 80s, the systems got bigger, IBM mainframes, and we also got a Cray XMP, which is the uh, yellow and blue uh, striped object uh, over there in the corner. But at the same time, they got smaller as we started to see digital VAX and graphical workstations, which allowed us then to be interacting directly with the data rather than having to uh, go through a printing and analysis process. This was starting to be a major breakthrough for the physicists to be able to actually do work, even starting to be interactive. The 90s was a period of great change. Um, we shifted from the mainframes towards Unix workstations um, in use for calculations as well as for this uh, graphical display. And the networking consolidated onto TCP IP. We had a, a variety of different technologies in the past, but in CERN became one of the big internet hubs for Europe. At the same time, we saw the World Wide Web towards the, uh, the start of the 90s. And that was with Tim Berners-Lee, a, a UK scientist who tried to find ways under which we could be sharing information. Um, the initial browser was text only. Um, but uh, it then evolved from there into being the, uh, the technology it was today. One of the features I think that led to the success of that was that CERN uh, put the entire source code into the public domain, and this allowed then people to build from it rather than uh, other technologies at the time like Gopher that were looking to uh, monetize uh, their, their solutions. So one of the natures of being a publicly funded organization is that we can be able to be handing this kind of knowledge back to society. Today, the Unix machines have been replaced by Linux boxes. Um, and we went through a phase of getting standard Linux desktops, um, racking them up ourselves, and then gradually moved towards rack mounted servers. Today in the data center, the one from the 1970s, um, we are certainly seeing the limits of the power density and cooling. Um, the new machines are fairly uh, hot in terms of their operation, and therefore we're not able to even fill up racks completely to the top. 
we're only able to install something like a third or a half of the, the density of the machines themselves. This is a constraint and we're looking to address that going forward. So data analysis itself goes from the detector, gradually filtering down the data. We go through processes of analyzing the tracks, identifying what the particles are, and then hand that data over to the physicist who then tests out their theories and their working groups to start to produce an idea of, are there any anomalies in the data? To validate that anomaly, we then have a corresponding leg, which is simulation. This is compute intensive rather than data intensive. And this takes the theory, uh, attempts to produce maps of what the experiments ought to be seeing. And then the analysis process involves comparing the theory and the reality together and in cases such as the Higgs, then we found a little peak at 125 giga electron volts that corresponded to the Higgs boson. So how do we do this? We don't have enough capacity at CERN on its own. CERN can act as the central tier zero where we do data recording, we do initial analysis, but then after that, we need to distribute this data across the world. Um, 150 uh, different labs that we collaborate with that take the data from CERN and analyze it, sending the results uh, to the other labs as well so that they can then share them. Initially, we thought that we were having problems with network reliability. In practice, the internet streaming environments have meant that networks have actually ended up being the most reliable component of these, of these grids. And these have really rapidly evolved. So CERN today, um, we've got about 10,000 servers in the, in the computer center. Uh, it, it's about 415,000 uh, cores. For disks, it's about uh, 95,000. Um, the tape drives are a particular aspect I'll, I'll come on to in a moment, but equally from the network point of view, we have a mass of routers in the computer center connecting all these systems together. And for the lab itself, we are very, very heavy mobile uh, Wi-Fi users um, with thousands of people coming to CERN for a visit to do uh, specific pieces of work. Clearly it's a very dynamic environment and that means that uh, Wi-Fi for us is a key part of uh, delivering that. The tapes, um, many people are surprised to find that we're still using tapes and this is primarily a cost and power question. Um, discs themselves um, require power in order to carry on spinning. Whereas tapes, once you park the tape into its slot it can remain there without needing power. The only power you need is for when you access the data, the robot goes, finds the tape and puts it into a tape drive. And these robots that we've got, it's six large robots do about 60,000 mounts a week. So if you imagine your old VHS recorder and the reliability of those, um, doing 60,000 mounts a week with something which does require very high quality engineering. Um, and these we buy from industrial suppliers and uh, the reliability is very, very good. So basically we have a disc cache and then after that around 32,000 cartridges distributed through the robots that have the bulk data for when the data isn't actually needed at that time. The data itself though, it's also important that it's made available to the general public who fund CERN after all. So we do a number of open initiatives. Um, open access publishing is where we wanted to be sure that the scientific publishing and papers that we write would be available to the general public without additional charge. The traditional models for access to scientific uh, publications was that you would have to buy the journal. Um, this is a mode um, allowed the companies to then fund the scientists that were reviewing those papers, but meant that the general public couldn't get access to the data. So we've been initial, uh, initiating something called open access publishing, where we actually fund the reviewing by the journals. And this data is then made available through the internet for the scientists, uh, sorry, for the general members of the public and scientists to study. We also make data from the LHC are available through an open data portal. And this allows uh, it to be reused for citizen scientists who would like to uh, be a physicist for the day, um, run through the analysis that some of us have done, but also to be used for different levels of teaching. So schools can go through some of the more simple analysis and university students can also uh, run through those physics before they come and uh, do some work at CERN. 
At the same time, one of the ways that we contribute back to society is also through open source. So um, we are very uh, strong advocates of open source software, but also of open source hardware. Um, and this is a way under which we take the extreme challenges of the LHC, uh, use open source community software, and then help to improve those pieces of software based off the challenges that we have at CERN. Open hardware is an interesting aspect where we now increasingly make the designs of the sensors of the LHC available to the general public so that this can then be used, for example, uh, to devise similar sensors for other purposes. Being a publicly funded organization, we're able to share all our information about our experiences very widely. Um, so it's, not, it's an organization that can be very open as well in terms of outreach. Looking forward, so the Hylomosti LHC, we're looking at of the order of 600 petabytes of raw data every year coming from the Hylomosti LHC. Um, but we're also seeing at the same time other large data environments, that, that's social media. So um, the sort of Facebook upload rates are comparable to, uh, to what we'll be seeing in the Hylomosti LHC. And equally in the bulk storage area, Google's Internet Archive is exabytes. Um, so this means that working with both companies and also with other sciences, um, the Square Kilometer Array is an astronomy uh, experiment which is just starting up now in South Africa and Australia and will be of similar size to, to CERN. So clearly we are out there identifying other large data uh, academic environments and collaborating with them. So one of the big projects that we're running at the moment is to see, can we find ways under which to manage this huge volume of data across sciences? And this is everything from radio astronomy, visible light, gamma rays, uh, astronomy, and then the physics experiments, particle physics and nuclear physics, along with the gravitational wave experiments like LIGO and Virgo, and cosmic ray neutrinos that look at the beams that come from the sun and uh, then uh, attempt to uh, analyze the neutrinos that are there. So this European Union funded Horizon 2020 project is looking to see how can we align the tools that we are using so that we can all be taking a common approach across all sciences. This is good for both the sciences, but also good for the laboratories that support them because many laboratories will end up supporting multiple big sciences. Going forward on the technology side, we're seeing Moore's law is not holding anymore. So um, the theory that said that as you increase the number of transistors, you would therefore increase the corresponding processing power. Um, the clock speeds are basically flat since 2007. The number of cores are increasing, but increasingly it's difficult to actually use all of those cores at the same time as we see different bottlenecks. And this is a worrying thing for us because as we look out to the high luminosity LHC um, out to 2027, we see a curve of how technology will by its nature evolve. And then we have a look at what we need, which is the blue lines above. And these are significantly larger than it would be. So given that we're gonna be producing 10 times more collisions and they'll be more complex, then at that point, we have a gap between where technology will go and equally with a flat budget, um, what we could afford. And this is a worry for the science and a lot of work is going on now to try and find innovative ways under which we can be using modern computing technologies and addressing that gap. At the same time, the public can help. Um, there is the LHC at home program. Um, if you have a home PC uh, with a screensaver on it, you're welcome to download this and install it. And what it will do is to do uh, some compute intensive workload in the background, for example, simulations of particles going around the accelerator to make sure that the magnets are positioned in the right places and the field strengths are, are correct. And with this, you can actually help out the LHC program. It doesn't use your network bandwidth though, so you don't have to worry about conflicts with the family um, when they're streaming. Same time, we're needing to build a new computer center. The old one in the 19, built in the 1970s clearly is unable to handle the density of compute equipment that's now coming out. This one will be a 12 megawatt center, so that's four times the current center, and we'll be aiming to bring this online in 2023. It's a very high density computer center with very efficient cooling infrastructure. 
So this means that we don't have the large raised floor that we have in the 1970s data center. We don't have high roofs that make it difficult to arrange the cooling structures. And we also have heat recuperation. So the hot air that comes out of the data center will then be used to heat offices around the site. Um, and this is going to be a significant uh, ecological improvement on the current situation too. We'll also be using cold air from the outside without needing chillers during the cold winter months in, in Geneva. So how we'll be using the centre. So clearly we do need to have a look to see how can we exploit the maximum amount of existing hardware using the vectorization and parallelization functions, rewriting the software to take advantage of these. We're using accelerators, the GPUs, graphical processing units, and then some of the more advanced units um, are starting to come online and we're starting to adapt how we could use those. But on their own, this can help, but we're also looking at very disruptive approaches. Um, machine learning is already promising. It's a challenge because Machine learning to identify cat pictures as being cats um, is something that we know. Machine learning to identify things we don't know is a real challenge. But pushing further beyond that, looking at things like modeling of biological architectures in the nervous system to learn, and then after that, be able to apply those systems. Quantum computing, um, I won't go into details. There's a very good set of online lectures in the quantum.cern uh, website. But basically with this, it potentially allows us to be running multiple analyses in parallel and then allowing the quantum technology to be identifying the good candidates. And DNA storage. Um, DNA itself effectively encodes uh, a two-bit combination um, with the strands of DNA. Could DNA storage be used to apply the bulk storage necessary and the long-term data preservation that we need for the LHC? So this isn't just a technology problem. It's going to also require that we take a fresh look at how we write programs. And that is dependent on the software and hardware engineers working on these areas. So CERN and COVID clearly, um, it's been a major disruption for the laboratory. Uh, we're used to having 8,000 people on the site and in, in uh, recent times since March, 2020, that's not been possible. Some work, though, cannot be done remotely. Um, if you're testing a superconducting magnet um, with liquid helium, this is not something you can take home. Um, equipment upgrades to the detectors, you needed to physically be working at them. And therefore, we did were in a position where we had to have some people on site and there were appropriate health measures that we took. Some people's home environments were not necessarily productive working environments. And so for those cases, they also arranged workplaces at CERN. But since we're very used to worldwide collaboration, many people weren't at CERN in any case because they were at their home institutes and would then come to CERN. We were very used to video conferencing and so could make that transition very quickly. But now that we're resuming a little bit, we're actually noticing there are some changes in behavior because people have still got the habit of raising their hands in Zoom and they even do this in physical meetings rather than the normal uh, boisterous uh, discussions that, that go on. CERN itself, since we're just down the road from the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, we have been uh, helping out in various discussions around how we do large scale collaborations and tools. And also we had some hardware that we wanted to be retiring, but since physically the retirement teams could not come on site, we contributed to the protein folding uh, volunteer programs with programs like folding at home. The IT department switched to almost 100% teleworking. Um, We've already been investing a lot in managing servers remotely, not going into the data center because the data center environment was not a conducive environment being 35 plus degrees centigrade uh, inside. And equally collaboration through open source communities meant we were very used to the remote working culture, sprints, agile uh, technologies and server installations are now starting again. The hardware availability is a little bit difficult in some cases because server production lines have been uh, distribute, uh, disrupted by uh, the pandemic. We're back on site a little bit more, um, and in particular, having the visit service is a really positive thing. Many people have found that teleworking is a benefit, and so we are looking to see how can we relax the rules a little to allow people this flexibility. And we also carry around on site proximity detectors, since many people are coming from a wide variety of different countries, we couldn't standardize on a single app and proximeters provide us the contact tracing and the warning in the event of uh, close contacts with people. Um, public visits, you can now book. 
So um, if you are in the Geneva area, then uh, you can go along to the visit site and they will explain the current state of, of where things are. The CERN store is also open if you want to buy any CERN themed uh, mementos, such as uh, magnet shaped uh, mobile phone batteries or mugs with Dirac's equation on them. So in conclusion, there's a long history of pushing the frontiers of, of computing in order to address the challenges of the LHC, um, the World Wide Web being the most famous one of those, but the number of uh, contributions across all areas of software and hardware is very significant. Significant collaboration with industry, arranging this data to made, be made available, allows CERN to contribute back to society and keep that outreach and engagement um, with the general public. The Higgs boson uh, discoveries reached around 1 billion people around the world through various different forms of media, which is an incredible outreach result. And all of this is key to inspire people who wish to go into areas like physics, but also engineering and IT for the future. And it's only by getting this stream of people enthusiastic in order to get involved in solving some of these difficult challenges that we're going to be able to address them in the, uh, the future. So that was the brief overview and uh, you're welcome to go to home.cern uh, if you'd like to get a little bit more information about what we do uh, along with a few of the links in the presentation. I'm happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you, Tim, that was incredible. Um, mind blowing stuff. I think possibly the most human thing was Win Klein. Uh, he was your computer in the 1950s. Uh, whatever happened to him? So I'm not sure, uh, he has a Wikipedia page and amongst things, he was one of the people that calculated the largest number of digits of square root of two as a mental calculation, and it's staggering numbers. So I think the Wikipedia page is a great page to go to to see that the brain is actually um, also a very powerful computer. And maybe that's where neuromorphic computing gets to be interesting uh, if we're able to do it. Um, there's some amazing things there. Um, you mentioned that, um, sorry, I was gonna just summarize a few things. Um, the fact you got 380 petabytes worth of tape and robots pull it out of storage. Um, I mean, you said most people would be surprised by it. I see, I understand the reason for it. When you move to the new data center, do you think that will still be tape or are you gonna be moving on to something, uh, disk or, or, or solid state by that point? So I think what we're going to plan to do with the new data center is because it's a very efficient high density data center, we will put the compute resources into there um, we should then be able to fill up the racks with modern machines. Um, and the data itself will continue to reside in the old computer center um, that we have the other side of the border. Mm -hmm. um, and we will then put in multiple terabits of networking between the two centers so that the access to the data will be transparent. Um, so we can effectively run multiple data centers as if they were just rooms in the same data center using modern technology uh, for networking. So, and also just follow up on briefly, the racks, you said a third to a half of racks in the current data center are used, and that was because of the, the heat they generate, was that correct? Right, so we can only have around six kilowatts per square meter in the uh, current data center. And that means that with a modern uh, two processor configuration, then we can get of the order of um, 10 or 12 um, systems in there, uh, whereas the racks could actually take a significantly larger number. So that means we're just not able to keep them cool if we were to put in too many in a single area and new technologies like GPUs are pushing things even further um, because those generate even more heat. So those are the kind of systems that we would look to be bringing in line in 2023 in the new data center. I mean, I say the new data center sounds staggering. It's a great, great balance of technology and ecology going on there. Um, we've got one question just coming from Chris Cameron. He's asked, um, does much work go into modernizing old data? You'd mentioned there was lots of paper tape in the 60s. Um, is that data migrated or stored on modern disk or tape? So we have the aim that all of the data should continue to be available going forward. Um, so we have migrated the mainframe uh, stores onto new tape, reformatted them so they are readable by Linux systems. So the data itself is available and we have data preservation programs that endeavor to get the programs and the workflows to continue working. And this gets to be very interesting when, for example, one of the new future colliders would be a, 
electron-positron collider. And we had one of those at much lower energy in the 1990s. And one of the things that we're very keen on being able to do is any discovery we have with the new collider, then we ought to be able to go back and reanalyze the data from previously. Mm -hmm. So we have a significant program of data preservation and rerunning old analyses in order to be able to be able to reproduce the results of yesterday on today's uh, computers. Unfortunately, the most difficult thing with this is capturing the knowledge of the people. Um, so it's one thing to be able to copy the data in one format to the other. It's another thing to remember how on earth you run the programs, what the parameters are. Mm. And it's key that we capture that information before the people retire. Definitely. It's always a challenge, IT, isn't it? Capturing information, especially in something like something as big as this. Uh, Tony Abbey just dropped a question too. Uh, with 95% of the universe not being understood, is there a team working on whether the Big Bang Theory should be superseded? Should be like that sacrilegious talk, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure if he means the TV series or the, uh, the event. Um, it's certainly one of those things that it, it, it is questioned on a regular basis and... Um, there are branches of particle physics that are looking at this. Um, it's really not at all clear how we model it. Um, and gradually, as we start to see more and more characteristics of some of these fundamental particles, we're looking for really minute differences that if you multiply into the mass of the, the universe could actually account for some of this. Um, so it would really take an infinitesimally small difference when you multiply it by the 14 billion years that we've had and the size of the universe could start to account for some share. So maybe the 95, there are some theories that might bring it down to something of the order of 80 or 75 that are currently uh, in discussion. Um, mm -hmm. It's still 75% that we don't know though. And uh, yeah, so the, st the standard model, is that safe for now or are they, are they always chipping away at that? For the moment, it's proved to be remarkably robust. Um, so there are still some things that aren't explained by the standard model. Mm. But it's certainly been an incredibly successful long-term uh, model as uh, the Higgs boson has fitted into it as that piece of the jigsaw that uh, really helped to complete it. I don't think it's enough on its own, but um, the theorists would be better in a position to uh, give the details as to why not. Cool. Um, are there any, um, <coughs> picking up on the airtime here, we've had some questions on chat. Does anybody want to pop a question to Tim uh, over, uh, over verbally, over, over video while we, while we have him? If you have just unmute yourself, go for it. T Terry, is that, did you put your hand up? Can't, can't quite hear you, Terry. Well, no, it's okay, I just found the button. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, you mentioned the, um, was it South African Large Array uh, Astronomical Experiment? Um, I gather the amount of data produced by that is going to be equivalent to the current output of the internet at the moment. Any idea how it's going to get from A to B so that it can be analyzed? This is certainly one of those um, things where we have to anticipate how technology is going to evolve going forward. Um, so the, the square kilometer array data rates, especially given that some of the areas have to be by their nature well away from towns. Um, ast astronomy means that you really need to be sure you've got a very quiet radio uh, space. So these are in the middle of the uh, deserts in Australia and South Africa. Um, and clearly just getting that to the nearest centers, be it Perth or Cape Town, is already a challenge. And then after that, getting that data to where the different laboratories are will require some advances in network technology. In practice, we've found that the huge demand for internet networking means that we are able to be reasonably confident that by the time these experiments come online, that the bandwidth uh, has been uh, able to be provided. Um, so here, part of it's a matter of trusting industry and the needs of the public. Um, so we don't need to necessarily do advanced research in areas where you can see from the curve that there are things that are going to work out. And networking looks really, we'll need to put in some fibers, but um, it's really looking promising. Thank you. Uh, do we have another, I've got another question here lined up from Chris, but before I go to that, <coughs> uh, questions uh, by video? If you just yeah, I've got a question. Um, obviously, you can't do backups. So what, what do you do for disaster recovery? So um, when I mentioned the worldwide computing grid, 
Um, so these are these 150 labs around the world. Um, we make sure that any data that's stored at CERN is also replicated into one of 12 large sites, which also have tape robots. So that means that we are able, we would not lose the LHC data in the event of a problem occurring at CERN. Um, now, clearly the laboratory itself would be significantly affected in the event of a, of a problem. And one of the things that we're aiming to do with the second data center, um, which is a number of kilometers away, um, will be to make some of those key functionalities of the laboratory itself um, highly available with business continuity style approaches. Um, the sort of aspects of that, it, it's less the physics side and is more the ability to function as an organization, to make payments of salary, um, for people to book holidays, um, to pay bills. Um, those are the, the parts that would be the first things that would have challenges at CERN. Um, keep the mail system running, uh, the phone system, that kind of thing. Physics would be more difficult to do because they have to be a lot replicated in order to do that. And there we would use these other sites to run the physics processing workloads. Right, so how long does it take from the data being generated by detectors before it's able to start to be analyzed? Um, so one of the features of the modern computer hardware is that we actually now have a very significant uh, compute capability at CERN that can do quasi real-time processing of the data. Um, it's not completely real-time, but we're talking turnaround time in days compared to weeks in years past. Um, and this has allowed the physicists potentially to do things such as sometimes the data is arriving so fast that we park data directly onto tape. We analyze some, and then during these long shutdowns when the accelerator isn't running, we then catch up on the backlog. Um, so the physicists themselves are able to start to be having a look at the quality of the data, making sure that bits of the detectors are working um, within a few hours of uh, those collisions occurring. And then how often is the software enhanced? Um, so the, the applications themselves are very interesting because they're written, um, the physics applications are written by the physicists. Um, so these are physicists by training. Um, they're also programmers, <coughs> but it means that they do have to do a lot of work to codify the physics knowledge into applications. We now use C++ um, after it replaced Fortran. The applications themselves are generally being updated daily. Um, there are new versions. We don't always install the new version straight away um, because there needs to be some physics analysis done in order to guarantee that the new versions of the programs are producing the same results as the old versions. And some of this can be automated, but parts of it can't. Um, so this means there are usually cycles of updates. Um, and that means that we take advantage of what we call technical stops. And this is periods during which the accelerator has been running for a few weeks. And then we have, for example, a week to do short-term interventions. Um, and in those times, there's often a lot of IT work that goes on. The infrastructure itself, we're actually uh, upgrading all the time. Um, we have quality assurance environments. We validate uh, new operating system versions and roll those out in a dynamic fashion. And having a cloud there means that we can also uh, live migrate workloads as we need to and uh, go through maintenance work without it being disruptive. Well, I think I, I dropped out there, so I think I might have miss, missed the question, but hopefully, uh, hopefully yes, they I were- covered the two questions that were in the chat. Cool, yeah. okay, thank you. Seamlessly done, well done, Tim, thank you. That's Wi-Fi for you. Um, <laughs> Maybe you're a little bit set up, better set up than I am. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. Do we have a, uh, there was, uh, that takes care of the chat questions. I think, was there uh, any more questions for Tim while we have, I had one more, but if someone else has got another one, go for it. Just jump in there. No, anyone? Cool, okay. Um, Can I just ask a quick follow-up? Um, sure. Yeah, Chris, Is there any time, Tim, that your um, infrastructure ever gets unused because you've run out of data? Um, in theory, we have an infinite compute capacity need. Um, in general, CERN's goal is to analyze the data that's coming in. However, in the event of 
for example, towards the end of a run, the number of collisions does reduce a little bit because uh, some collisions have already occurred, uh, some bunches are starting to get uh, a little bit undense. Um, at that point, we switch more simulation workload on. So this is the random number generators that model the universe through the theory. Normally, we're not doing a lot of simulation at CERN. That's being done at the other centers around the grid. But as soon as we have any machine free, we use simulation um, in order to keep those machines busy. We also run simulation, for example, on hardware that's about to be retired, because this can be stopped and restarted trivially. Um, and that way we make sure that machines are kept busy throughout the whole of their life cycle of five years. And actually at the end of this, we generally are giving the old machines away to other physics laboratories in places where they can't necessarily afford the most recent hardware. So uh, recently we shipped a, a set of machines to Tunisia um, and there they'll be installed and put back on the grid and are used also to train up local systems administrators uh, in computing techniques as well. So the machines are, are worked hard through their entire life cycle. And just one last question. Do, do you ever have a need to um, overspill to other, um, to extra power? You know, would you ever need to use AWS or Azure or anything to give you some extra um, peak capacity or something? So we do look at public clouds and generally you're still running workloads on public clouds and are running a number of projects in order to keep um, making sure we have that capability. Um, if we look at the total cost of running the workloads uh, with the network connections, um, clearly uh, the multi-terabit connections have a certain egress uh, and ingress charges that uh, make that expensive. Um, but we definitely want to be able to carry on being capable. In particular, there are some very interesting devices around the machine learning area, which are only available in public clouds. Um, so some of the TPUs and IPUs, um, those will come out in public clouds and therefore we have to find ways to integrate those into our workflows and, and we do the, that workload. Yeah. So we take advantage of them as they are interesting. Um, for the moment, um, the, the new data center should cover us for, for a while yet for the bulk capacity. That's great, thanks Tim. Um, great. Just sorry. Just one final question. I was uh, you were talking there about the, um, the the you know Moore's law is not keeping up, and we're looking at some of the requirements for the future. And we looked also at the um, uh, the the growth in computing uh, where it was in reality with Moore's law, etc. And your the blue line that went up on on where uh, CERN's requirements are in the future. And we've talked about this this collaboration with the other labs that CERN is involved in. I suppose. What's you looked at some of the the, the workarounds, you know, the machine learning, etc., and the use of DNA storage. Um, how much is there? Will you be looking at um, server? You know, will you be was there a kind of a requirement, or will you be looking to the industry to solve some of the these needs in computers and processors, etc.? Will we be feeding back to them uh, to in the hope they will be able to do stuff in the hardware and the software, or is this all kind of more stuff? The machines will come to you and you will look at ways around it in, you know, with your own approaches, Tim. So CERN has a, a framework called CERN Open Lab that we use to collaborate with industry. So um, the aim behind that is that we take the challenges of the LHC, industry comes along with its new um, developments, uh, its roadmaps, and then we sit down and use the extreme challenges that we have to then battle harden some of these new technologies. Um, so what that means is that if you can handle the CERN workload, then chances are by the time you then come to a, a product on the market, um, then that's something which you can then say, uh, this has been through a fairly hard uh, workover. Um, so the CERN Open Lab is a, is a public framework also, um, and there are some details on some of the research projects that we're, we're doing there. And that's with companies like Intel and Oracle and Micron, um, Siemens. Um, so Generally new ideas come in often from industry into that framework, and then we analyze the potential applications together. So it's a very iterative process. Okay, cool. Good, all right, well, that's about it. Um, before we wrap up and say goodbye to Tim, that was, that was great. Uh, I'm still kind of reading from some of those, those stuff. Every time I talk to him about CERN, I, I walk away more impressed than I was last time. Um, 
just uh, before everyone heads off and we say thank you to Tim, just a reminder, we mentioned the Square Kilometre Array. We've got Verity Allen will be talking to us in September, who's doing some of the core software programming on the Square Kilometre Array. And she'll be talking about the evolution of uh, computing and radio astronomy, um, about in touching on some of the systems that are very near and dear to our hearts at uh, the National Museum of Computing, including EDSAC, EDSAC 1 and uh, Trident. Um, but also she'll be looking at the achievements of some of the people who worked on those systems. Everyone gets the, the publicity goes towards the people who were in charge of these labs and the Nobel Prize winning work. But she'll be looking at some of the women who are involved in these programs as well and discussing the, the compute and the people. So come back to if, you, if it's good for you, come back again in September. We'll be tackling, tackling computing in the, the uh, square kilometre array. Having plugged that mercilessly, uh, Tim, that just leaves me to thank you so much for joining us this evening from lovely France. Um, if everyone could please just show their appreciation, um, it'd be fantastic. Thanks, Tim. It's great chatting to you again. Thanks. It was great to talk to you. Take care. Good to see you. Bye.